Good evening, everyone. We are glad to have all of you here with us today to celebrate the high octane and exuberant occasion of International Women in Mathematics Day. Myself, Sai Ganga, I'm a research scholar at BML Munjal University. May 12th is celebrated as International Day for Women in Mathematics since 2019. The day is in honor of Maria Mirsa Khani, born 12th May 1977, who won the Fields Medal in 2014. This is a joyful occasion for the mathematical community as well as for the women's community. I'm delighted to inform you that we'll be hosting a guest lecture presented by Dr. Geeta Venkatraman. She's an expert in the field of mathematics and has made significant contribution in the field. Today's talk will bring a wealth of knowledge and experience that will undoubtedly inspire and enlighten us all. Now, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Akla Hussain, Associate Professor of BMU to speak a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm pleased to be here to welcome all of you for Celebrate's uh, Day. In fact, uh, it should have been celebrated on May 12, which also falls as the birthday of Professor Maria Mirza Khani. But anyway, we could get time from Professor Geeta for this day. So thank you so much. And as uh, Ganga already introduced, uh, Professor Mariam Mirzani was the first woman mathematician to receive the most pre prestigious award in mathematics, which is called the Fields Medal, for those who are not from, you know, mathematics background. I welcome you all for this uh, event. And I will say a few words about Professor Mariam Mirzakhani before we start. So, Professor Mirzakhani was an Iranian mathematician and a professor of mathematics at Stanford University. Her research interests include in hyperbolic geometry, ergodic theory, and symplectic geometry. She was one of the leading experts in geometry and dynamical systems uh, while her work at Stanford University and her beautiful and astonishing results as well as her entire life is, a, is an example for many ins inspirational mathematicians, whether it is men or women, to pursue their dreams in science and especially in mathematics. So in August 14, uh, August 2014, she was awarded the Fields Medal for her groundbreaking work uh, in the field of um, the dynamics and geometry of Riemannian surfaces and their moduli spaces. And thus she became the first lady to receive this medal by that date. Of course, after that, we have one woman mathematician who received the Fields Medal. And eventually, uh, uh, after she passed away due to her untimely demise, it was decided unanimously by uh, in by the meeting in the World Meeting for Women in Mathematics in Rio de Janeiro in 2018 that in her honor, May 12 will be celebrated as Women in Mathematics Day. So since then, this day is being celebrated as uh, to honor and to encourage and to acknowledge the work of women mathematicians all across the world. So we are very fortunate to have Professor Geeta here. And now I would like to, uh, obviously we would like to listen to her and uh, to enrich our experiences and also the contribution of Professor Mirza Khani as well as some Indian women mathematicians who have done a great job over, uh, over an entire centenary and we would like to hear from her. So thank you very much, Ganga. Thank you so much, sir. It is my great pleasure to welcome our esteemed chief guest, Dr. Geeta Venkatraman, Professor of Mathematics at Dr. B. R. Ambedkar University, who has dedicated her career to mathematics. She did BSc Honours in Mathematics at St. Stephen College, University of Delhi. She stood first in Delhi University in BSc Mathematics. She completed her Master's with the INLAC Scholarship and Doctor of Philosophy with the Burton Senior Scholarship at the University of Oxford. Her area of research is finite group theory. She has authored a research monograph titled Enumeration of Finite Groups published by Cambridge University Press. She's also author of book title, A Bridge to Mathematics, published by Sage Publications, and book title, Learning Mathematics Through Modeling and Simulation, an investigative approach published by University Press Private Limited. Dr. Geeta was also part of the team that co-authored policy document, Education Technology Roadmap, Government of India, in November 2017. Dr. Geeta has served on several government committees related to both mathematics and education. She has advised several universities in India on their mathematics curriculum. At AUD, she has served as Dean Research and Consultancy, Dean Assessment Evaluation and Student Progression, 
Dean School of Undergraduate Studies and as a chairperson of the Committee for Pre Prevention of Sexual Harassment. Prior to joining AUD as a professor in 2010, she taught at St. Stephen College, University of Delhi. Dr. Geeta has published research papers related to group theory, popular articles related to mathematics and articles on education with an emphasis on undergraduate education. Apart from her interest in group theory and related areas, she is deeply interested in popularizing mathematics, mathematics education, issues related to women in mathematics and women in leadership in academia. Dr. Geeta is one of the five ambassadors of Committee for Women in Mathematics and International Mathematical Union and was a member of Executive Committee of Indian Women and Mathematics until March 2023. She was also one of the six people chosen to be a panelist in the panel discussion titled Girls in Mathematics, Reflections and Initiatives to be held as a part of World Meeting of Women in Mathematics 2022 prior to the International Congress of Mathematicians 2022. She is a founder member of Mathematics Teachers Association. She has also been on the editorial board of Resonance, a journal of science education, and is on the editorial board of the Little Mathematical Treasure series of the Ramanujan Mathematical Society. She has also been a member of the executive committee of the Ramanujan Mathematical Society. Currently, she is also a member of two committees of National Center for Mathematics. Her expertise extends beyond mathematics to photography. She's a keen bird watcher and a photographer of birds. A photograph of hers of the Southern Grey Shrike has appeared in the Handbook of Western Palearctic Birds, co-authored by Shirihai and Sivanson, published by Bloomsbury, London. Ma'am, we are very privileged to have you here today to talk about Professor Maria Mirsakhani's contribution, as well as the contribution of all other Indian women to mathematics. So without further ado, over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, you are muted. <laughs> so let me restart what I was saying. Uh, thank you, Aklak. Uh, uh, Sai Ganga, thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. Um, I, you, you put in quite a bit of effort to uh, pull out pictures, some of the photographs that I've taken of, of birds. So thank you very much for that as well. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank Zia for contacting me and asking me if I would uh, present something during this occasion. And as Aklak has already mentioned, uh, 12th May is Mariam Mirzakhani's uh, birthday. And um, uh, the entire month, in fact, is uh, events are taking place all across the world, not just in India. Um, to celebrate uh, the International Women's Day in Mathematics, which is 12th of May. Obviously, not all events can take place on the 12th itself. So uh, the entire month, in fact, and then um, uh, the, the, you can, in fact, find out all the events that are taking place, and many of them are online. And there's a website uh, for May 12th, which you can go to and find out about it. So without further ado, let me share my screen and um, get started. So um, I, I hope everyone can see the screen. Yeah, okay. Yes, ma'am, yes. So, uh, so the idea is to talk about Mariam's life, a bit of her work. I'm not, my area of research is group theory, which is quite removed from what Mariam works on. So I won't be able to go into any kind of depth related to her work, but I hope that I will give you a sense of the things that she's worked on. And uh, so part of the talk is going to be on Mariam. And the other part is I want to say something about, you know, what the situation is with women uh, mathematicians in India, what kind of efforts are being made, and also to introduce all of you to a few Maybe, uh, I, I, again, I won't go into any depth, but just to make you aware of the fact that we have some wonderful women mathematicians in India. So let, uh, let's get started. Um, 
So Mariam, as was mentioned, was the first Fields uh, woman to win a Fields medal in 2014. And she's generally known as a ma master artist of curved surfaces. And we'll see why. But a little bit of the history of how May 12th got to be chosen. Again, uh, this was mentioned by Aklak that uh, this happened during the World Meeting of Women in, on Mathematics in, uh, in, on July 31st in Rio in 2018. And this was an initiative proposed by the uh, Women's Committee of the Iranian Mathematical Society. And, the, uh, and it was voted as uh, something that everybody want, was in favor of. And a majority of the people uh, attending the WM Square uh, agreed to it. And in the year 2020, May 12th was finally chosen as a celebration of women in mathematics because, of course, Mariam was born uh, on May 12th. Um, now, this is actually a picture from the meeting, uh, from the meeting in Rio. And uh, uh, so they had, you can, you can see here uh, Professor Ridisha. Professor Ridisha is a professor at uh, um, JNU. It's professor of mathematics. And uh, she was chairing, we have an associate, well, it's, a, it's in a project mode, but there is something called the Indian Women in Mathematics. And uh, Riddhi was the chairperson of the executive committee of Indian Women in Mathematics from 2016 to 2019. So she was representing India on, on this uh, panel. And above, you can see a picture of the committee of, for women in maths. And again, we have the second person from the left is Professor Neela Natraj. She's a professor of mathematics at... Uh, um, the uh, IIT Mumbai and she in fact was the chairperson after uh, Riddhi uh, of IWM from 2019 till 2022. Currently it's uh, Professor Vijay Lakshmi Trivedi from TIFR Mumbai. The reason I'm bringing in Indian Women in Maths is because we are also going to talk about what's happened with uh, initiatives related to women in mathematics in India. And we'll come back to some of this a little later. And a bit more about the Committee for Women in Maths, which it's, an, it's a committee of the International Maths Union. And it's the only international committee for women in mathematics. And so CWM is overseeing the May 12th events. And it's through the CWM that we have a website to register all these events. And uh, in India, IWM uh, coordinates uh, May 12th activities within India. Okay, And as mentioned, we have, uh, so what CWM does is that in, its, uh, in the member countries of IMU, it appoints ambassadors. The main role of the ambassadors is to uh, you know, spread the word about CWM activities to kind of uh, make sure that, uh, you know, events are coordinated and they're attended. There's a newsletter that CWM brings out. So Riddhi, whom I've mentioned before, Neela, I, and Anisa uh, uh, are four of the members. And the fifth member is Sauli Gun. She's at Institute of Math Science, Chennai. And I also want to mention that under the um, uh, you know, support from CWM, there's a new association which has been formed. It's called Asia Oceania Women in Mathematics. And it's very, very recently formed association. It has countries from Asia and the uh, Oceania re region. And the first chairperson of this association is Sauli Gun. And uh, you can actually find out more about AOWM. We just had the first annual conference of AOWM. It took place in Bangalore in hybrid mode, end of April. So let's move on. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about an event that happened in India in 2010. So the first time we had the International Congress of Mathematicians being held in uh, India in 2010 in August at the University of Hyderabad. And uh, for the first ever uh, 
I, 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 ICM, what was decided was the two days prior to ICM would be devoted to celebrating women in mathematics. And this was supported by the European Women in Maths. And uh, so uh, at that point, CW, the Committee for Women in Maths had not yet been established. So this was done through various uh, women's associations. And the first ever international conference of women mathematicians was held. And you can see the wonderful posters that were created for that occasion. Now, why do I bring this up? Because there's a connection with Mariam. And uh, this was a list of speakers who spoke in that 2010 ICWM. So Mariam was in India in 2010 in August to attend ICWM to, she was one of the speakers there. And she gave a wonderful lecture. It was an amazing lecture. And, um, you know, the buzz in the entire uh, ICWM and ICM in that period was that, okay, here's the person who's going to be getting the Fields Medal the next year, next time ICM is held. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, Mariam, of course, won the, it was the uh, ICM in 2014 was in Seoul, Korea. And uh, Mariam won the Fields Medal there. Now, the point was that uh, you heard that there was an untimely, she died very young. She died when she was 40 on 14th July uh, uh, 2017 is when she passed away. And um, it was due to breast cancer. And she was already suffering or had probably just been diagnosed when she came to India. So uh, uh, the period after that has been had been very tough for her. Um, you know, treatment, there were periods when she thought she was getting better, but unfortunately, uh, cancer won. And this is a picture from uh, 2014. She's with her daughter, Anahita. And of course, you might recognize Manjul Bharka, who was the first person of Indian origin to, to get uh, the Fields Medal. Um, and of course, now uh, we also have Akshay Venkatesh, um, who won the Fields Medal in subsequently. But this was from 2014 in Seoul. Um, also, um, I, uh, Riddhi, I and Nikita had have written an article on Mariam, her life, and also trying to explain her work. And uh, this has come out in Resonance, uh, which is a journal of science education uh, produced from India. Indian Academy of Sciences brings it out. So please do take a look at it. It's freely available and uh, you can get to know in more detail about Mariam. So let I'm primarily borrowing from that and other sources when I tell you Mariam's story. So Mariam was born on 12th May 1977. These are the kinds of things from her childhood. She liked playing nurse. She liked drawing pictures. She liked reading. And this is a picture with her parents. Um, so how did she get interested in mathematics? Um, so she had an elder brother who told her a story about Gauss and taught her the method by which Gauss added the first hundred numbers. So uh, these days, of course, we all have learned the formula and we prove it by induction of adding the first n numbers. But look at what Gauss did. So uh, Gauss, um, basically took the first 100 numbers and he paired them. So one was paired with 100, two was paired with 99, three with 98 and 50 with 51. So you can see that there are 50 brackets here and in each bracket, the total is 101. So that's how he got the number. Uh, how, And this is such a fascinating piece of, you know, mathematics, you can explain to a school student that, look, you can just group the numbers in this way and you have this very nice way of adding these numbers. And a primary school child would understand. So this kind of fascinated Mariam that there's a nice 
there's, you know, you can do bits of manipulation in mathematics and get to something wonderful. So she grew up in Iran and she had wonderful support from her parents. Uh, she had three siblings and her high school teachers also supported her. And um, in an interview given in, uh, to Clay Mathematical Institute in 2008, Mariam said, I was lucky in many ways, the war ended. So her childhood was during the Iran-Iraq war, which lasted from 1980 to 88. So the war ended when I had finished elementary school and I couldn't have had the great opportunities that I had if I had been born 10 years earlier. So this was the timing was correct. And she had just finished elementary school. She took an entrance exam and she was admitted to a very good middle school for girls in Tehran called the Farzanegan Middle School. And the school's aim was to nurture exceptional talent and educate the brightest of the students. But when she joined, Mariam didn't do well mathematically in her first year. And in fact, her teacher then apparently told her that you're not good at maths at all. So I think uh, at various stages when you're studying mathematics, if you've had a bad year or you know, you've not done so well at a particular point in your time, you should just ignore it. Um, like in, in Mariam's case, apparently at that time, she read a lot of books. She went to a bookstore near her middle school and she in fact thought that she would be a writer and an author. But lo and behold, the next year the teacher changed and I think she got on well with the teacher, the teacher who could explain mathematics to her and she did started doing extremely well. And she also made a very, very good friend in Roha, Roya Behesti. And Roya was also mathematically talented. So you can imagine that in this girls' school, there are these two girls who are total keen beans as far as mathematics is concerned. And their school principal also wanted girls to do extremely well. And she encouraged them in their mathematics. And they made a very good team. And in, start, in fact, they started solving Olympiad level problems. And they were soon breaking the glass ceiling of what was considered only a boys, um, uh, only boys were representing Iran till then uh, in the uh, International Maths Olympiad. But uh, Roya and Mariam uh, participated for the first time in 1994. And Mariam got 41 out of 42 and won a gold, gold medal. And in fact, in 1995, again, she got a gold medal in the International Maths Olympiad. And this time, she had a perfect score. Okay, so uh, soon after that, she joined uh, for the Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, and she completed her Bachelor of Science in 1999. And as an undergraduate, she'd already published three research papers, two of which were in graph theory. So she enjoyed her period in Sharif University. She was actually getting to discuss mathematics with her peers, and she was doing extremely well and uh, got admitted to Harvard University to do graduate work. And uh, uh, so in Harvard, her supervisor was Curtis McMillan, and he had just been awarded a Fields Medal in 1998 and was appointed professor at Harvard at the same year that Mariam went. Mariam's background, of course, before she went to Harvard was more in combinatorics and algebra, and she was somewhat familiar with complex analysis. So initially, um, when she attended Curtis's lectures, she felt she could not understand very much, but she could appreciate the way in which Curtis brought alive topics and the way he could convey both simplicity and elegance. And he became Mariam's doctoral advisor. Um, so, uh, so this is something from uh, what Mariam said. I started asking him questions regularly and thinking about problems that came out of these illuminating discussions. His encouragement was invaluable. Working with Kurt had a great influence on me, though now I wish I had learned more from him. By the time I graduated, I had a list, long list of raw ideas that I wanted to explore. And this is what Curtis said about her. She had a sort of daring imagination. She would formulate in her mind an imaginary picture of what must be going on, then come to my office and describe it. At the end, she would turn to me and say, is it right? It, I was always flattered that she thought I would know. <laughs> so this is a Fields Medalist himself. 
who 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 saying this of uh, of what Mariam um, was like when she was his student. So she was she was obviously uh, absolutely brilliant. So Mariam worked on hyperbolic surfaces. A little later, we'll see what hyperbolic surfaces are for her doctoral work. In 2004, she got her doctorate from Harvard University. She had a 130-page thesis titled Hyperbolic Surfaces and Volume of the Moduli Space of Curves. And she got an award, the Leonard M. and Elianther Blue B. Blumenthal Award for her thesis. And uh, she was, in fact, offered a chance to continue at Harvard as a junior fellow. But instead, she took up a dual engagement as assistant professor in Princeton University, and she also had a Clay Research Fellowship. Now, uh, the Clay Research Fellowship, she felt particularly would allow her to work at problems uh, at her own pace. And according to Mariam, she was slow. <laughs> I don't think that may have been the case when, when others look at her work, but this is how she judged her own work, that she was slow at doing things. She produced some very, very deep papers on curved surfaces three years into the fellowship. These were published in the top journals in mathematics, like the Annals of Mathematics, Invenionis Mathematicae, and the Journal of the American Mathematical Society. And when she finished her Clay Fellowship in 2008, she joined Stanford University as a professor of mathematics. While at Princeton, she met her husband, Jan Wodrak, who was a Czech national and uh, had a double PhD in computer science and in applied mathematics from MIT. John was a postdoctoral teaching fellow at Princeton. They married in 2005 and had their daughter Anahita in 2011. And uh, in 2006, while she was on the Clay Fellowship, she began collaborating with a Chicago University mathematician, Alex Eskin. Together, they published several seminal works, including counting closed geodesics in moduli space in 2011. I will come back to what geodesics are a little later. Mariam continued to spear ahead with outstanding contributions to understand curved spaces. And she often was pictured with large sheets of paper spread on the ground on which she would be drawing. And her daughter would remark that her mother is painting. And uh, Mariam, of course, won many, many awards, the biggest of all being the Fields Medal. And uh, the Fields Medal uh, was, um, you know, when it came through, she was battling the dark cloud of breast cancer. And what is what we hear is that despite being quite ill, she actually continued to attend talks, workshops, and did mathematics. One of the accounts is by Rithi, who was attending a conference at the same conference at which Mariam was also there. And uh, this is what she said. Uh, Mariam used to be in the upstairs balcony and often stand there due to her medical condition and follow all the lectures. She would be shooting candid questions at the speakers from up there. The energy and enthusiasm with which she followed all lectures was amazing. She also gave a lecture at the conference. This was in 2015, just a year after her Fields Medal. And the other is an account by Kasra Rafi, who's, uh, who uh, said that in 2016, um, uh, she was walking with him to Stanford's maths department to attend a lecture de delivered by Mikhail Gromo. And at that time, Mariam's cancer had already spread to her bones and liver, and she was in very harsh pain, knowing that the time of a flight to eternity is very near. It was amazing that even in that situation, she restlessly walked to listen to a talk. Kasra said they had to stop every few minutes along the walk so that she could lie down on a bench to rest. So this is how Mariam, uh, you know, lived for mathematics and enjoyed the mathematics that she did. And um, what I'm going to show you now is a little video which was uh, made and it, uh, Mariam speaks about her own work. Um, this is for the Fields Medal. So let's see if it will play. It should. Uh, no, sorry. Just give me a minute.
I wasn't always very excited about math. I was more excited about reading novels and I thought I would become a writer one day. I got excited about it, maybe just as a challenge. But then I realized that it's really nice and that I enjoy it. These were quite difficult times. It was during the war. Right after the war, I had a lot of opportunities. I went to a very good middle school and then high school. I think I was the lucky generation because I was a teenager when things became more stable. My main interest is understanding structures you can put on a surface. There are different ways of looking at it. Either you have a surface with some additional geometric structures or this kind of problems are related to understanding the space of such structures. One very famous example is if you have a billiard table and you start from a point and you hit the ball and then hits the boundaries and it moves forever, you want to see the trajectory of the ball. Would it cover all your billiard table? Can you find closed billiard paths? And interestingly enough, this is an open question in general if you don't put any restrictions on the angles of the polygon that you started. There are two types of questions. One is about you have a surface with the geometric structure and you're trying to understand some properties of this geometric structure that you have. The other questions are related to you have a surface and you have a geometric structure and you start deforming this geometric structure and then you want to see what kind of surfaces you would get. Some of the problems like you know the properties of a generic surface, a random surface, but it's really hard to say something about a single given geometric structure on the surface. Some of the work that I've done with different collaborators shows that sometimes the surfaces are very similar to the ones of the generic surface. You can ask these questions about the hyperbolic surfaces or these flat surfaces or different geometric structures. I think these problems are important because they are related to some other problems. Even if you are interested in higher dimensional manifolds, one way of dealing with them is trying to find some nice surface inside of them. You end up learning a lot about other spaces and properties of other actions. So it gives you a lot of information. It's not only the question, but the way you try to solve it. I hope you were able to see the video which was showing. Atlak, were you able to see the video that showed? No, but we could hear only the voice. Oh, okay. I have no clue what happened. Maybe the, well, you heard the voice. It, it, it was actually a film. And I kept seeing that it said your screen sharing is paused. So maybe the next mm -hmm. video, I will try showing it in a different way. Voice was clear. Only thing was the video was not visible. I didn't realize that because I was seeing the video on my screen. So anyway, we'll continue with this and maybe in the next video, I'll try and make ask whether you're being able to see it or not. Um, so as we saw, I mean, at least you heard Mariam uh, speak about her own uh, work and so on. Um, Mariam, of course, made uh, wonderful contributions and uh, a, a lot of her work was trying to understand generic hyperbolic surfaces or other kinds of hyperbolic surfaces. So uh, a hyperbolic, here's, here's a little picture taken from Encyclopedia Britannica, which kind of tells you uh, uh, about Euclidean space, which is the space that we, are, we live in and what we are uh, most familiar with, where triangles, the interior angles of the uh, triangle add up to 180 degree. And then you have the spherical space where, like if you draw a triangle, quote unquote, a triangle on a sphere, you will see it's called an elliptical space. And the sum of the angles is greater than 180 degree. And when it's less, so you have uh, hyperbolic surfaces. They are surfaces with constant negative curvature. So you have what are called slim triangles on them. Professor and, Yuta, sorry to interrupt. Are you going through the slides? Because nothing is changing here. Oh, okay. Wait, we are seeing this still I video. Know, oh, let me share again. Sorry. Yeah, can you can you see now? Can you yes. see 
screen? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, technical issues are something that we have to contend with while having um, I think now you can see. Can yes. you see the screen? Yeah. Yes. So this is this, this. These were the three pictures that I was talking about. This is an elliptical space. This is how we are the space we are familiar with Euclidean space. And this is a hyperbolic uh, surface. Uh, in a typically in a hyperbolic surface, you have slim triangles. The sum of the three interior angles is less than one eighty degrees, and it's a surface with constant negative curvature. Okay, and um, so what's a geodesic? This is again something that came up earlier. So a geodesic on a surface generalizes the notion of a straight line in a plane. So if we have two points on a plane, um, the shortest path joining the two points is a straight line. So imagine that you had two points on a sphere. Then what would be the shortest path lying on the sphere which would join those two points? So uh, what you'll see is they're typically, the, the if the points lie, say, on a great circle, then it will be the shortest arc on the great circle which you have to traverse to, to reach that point. And a simple geodesic is one which does not intersect itself. Okay, so um, here are some pictures about geodesics. So this tell, this looks at, you know, the, the great circles which join two points and the arcs which will tell you. So for example, if I want to look at uh, Q1 and minus Q1, this, you know, there are these circles. You can trace the path which takes you there. And say from Q2 to minus Q2. Now, if you want to find out what is the geodesic between Q1 and Q2, you'll have to draw it, draw the corresponding great circle on the sphere, which connects. Ma'am, your slide is not changing again. Can you... You know, reshare, so, I think some issue, technical issue. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's sorry for this. Even it is uh, only partially. What's open. happening is it's saying that my screen sharing is paused for some reason. Uh, I wonder why that's happening every time. Here, can you see it now? Maybe every screen, I'll have to check whether it is yes, yes, going it. into a pause or not. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, so here, here are pictures again of geodesics. So let's look at this last one here at the bottom. So this is like on Earth, say you are on top of a mount. This is a mountain. And if you have to go from this point to this point, mm -hmm. from a Euclidean point of view, it's just a straight line, the shortest distance. But as a, a as a human being, you cannot traverse this line. Okay, so if you want to think about the shortest path you would take, which is lying on the surface, then it's the red line which is marked there. Okay, so that's to sort of make you understand that what we have within uh, our Euclidean distance is uh, not necessarily the shortest path you could have when you are actually traversing spaces which are which are different. Okay. Another thing that I should explain is genus of a so a torus is basically what we uh, what abroad they would call a donut or you know you can think of it as a nice big vada with a hole in the middle. Okay. Um, we'll see later that this can actually be created out of a square. Um, but this has one hole, okay? And if you, uh, a genus two surface can be uh, thought of as um, when you sort of attach two of these together in a particular mathematical way, okay? So two holes, and this is genus four. I mean, in, in some loose sense, the genus is kind of counting the holes in, in this, uh, in the surface that you're looking at. 
So here is one of the major work that uh, Mariam did. It's called, uh, it was published in Annals of Mathematics in 2008. And it's called Growth of the Number of Simple Closed Geodesics on Hyperbolic Surfaces. So I've shown you what hyperbolic surfaces are. I've mentioned to you what geodesics are. And we'll see that genus is talked about. I mean, intuitively, you think of genus as the number of holes that are there. And let's see what, the, what was so important about her work. So the work of Delsart, Huber, Selberg, and Margulis tells us that the number of closed geodesics of length at most capital L on a hyperbolic surface grows like e to the power L by L. So this is like an exponential growth that's happening. So if you're, uh, if you're fixing capital L as the length of your geodesics, and you're looking at closed geodesics. So they start and end at the same point. And their length is at most L. And you want to count how many such geodesics can you have in a uh, hyperbolic surface. And you want to see how it behaves, that number. right? So basically, they're saying that number behaves like e to the power L by L. So as L increases, the numerator is going to be e to the power L, which is an exponential growth averaged out by L as L tends to infinity. This was called the prime number theorem for hyperbolic surfaces. Now, what Mariam showed is that when you look at the number of simple closed geodesics, so simple geodesics are those that don't cross themselves, and we are looking at closed geodesics of length at most L, and Suppose you fix the genus of the hyperbolic surface. So the genus of the hyperbolic surfaces is G. So if you also fix that, then the growth is much lower, slower. It's, it becomes a polynomial growth. That is, as L tends to infinity, you find that there's a constant depending on the space X in a very nice way. And the total number is at most this constant times L to the power 6G minus 6, where G is the genus of the surface. So this says, so the earlier thing told you that there are, expo the as L grows to infinity, there are exponential number of closed geodesics of length at most L. And what Mariam showed is that if they're not, if they're simple geodesics, then they cannot grow exponentially. So it's this tells you, in fact, that most closed geodesics on these surfaces are going to be self-intersecting in because that's where the gap is coming in between the exponential growth and the polynomial growth. Yes, and so this was one of the seminal papers that she published in 2008. Another very big article that she wrote, which was a 200-page article along with Eskin, um, in, in common parlance in mathematical uh, in the mathematical world, the theorem that they proved is called the magic wand theorem, because apparently that particular theorem that they proved uh, managed to sort out a lot of outstanding problems in many different areas. So Macmillan, Mac who was her supervisor, had proved this theorem for genus two surfaces, but his techniques did not extend to higher uh, genera. Whereas Eskin and Mirzakani and later Amir Mohammadi together proved this result for higher genus surfaces, integrating ideas from topology, geometry, and dynamical systems. Now, uh, immediate result of this higher genus magic wand theorem was uh, application to what is called the famous billiards problem. So here the billiards problem is, we'll come to it, it's to try and understand the geometry of the initial billiard using the geometry of the orbit of any trajectory on the billiard table. And another application is to what is called the illumination problem, which was posed in 1950s by Strauss. And he said, imagine a room with mirrored walls. If a candle is placed at some location in the room, will it illuminate every other point in the room? And basically, the light ray is going to hit the wall and you have a mirror there. So it reflects back 
at the same angle as the angle of incidence. So by that, so there'll be multiple rays which will be uh, hitting. And so the idea is, can you actually illuminate all the points in the room? And what happened is that in 1958, Penrose created this curved room where no matter where you place the candle, so this little point here is the candle, and it shows that there's a patch of positive area which is not illuminated. So this gray and gray area is what is not illuminated. The white area is what gets illuminated by this candle. In fact, you can go to this website here and play around with the candle. So you can position the candle anywhere and it will show you what part is not going to be illuminated. Okay, now what Mariam, um, Mariam and Eskin's work actually manages to show is something about what are called a translation surfaces. So a translation surface is a finite union of polygons with a choice of pairing parallel sides of equal length. Such a structure arises naturally in the study of billiards and is used to frame the illumination problem mathematically. So for example, if you imagine the square, and uh, you uh, identify these two sides and kind of paste it. You get a cylinder like this. And the, it, the edges of the cylinder are basically these two sides. And so you again identify them and you get a torus. Similarly, you can do this kind of a thing, gluing using an octagon and end up with a two genus structure here. So in 2016, uh, Lelivre, Montel, and Weiss proved in a paper, everything is illuminated with a subtext, except possibly finitely many points, using the work of Mirza Khan. So basically what they said is that for any translation surface M, there are only finitely many points in M which are not illuminated by a given point in M. Okay. So the Penrose figure is not a translation surface, obviously, because what it said is that if you have a candle and you place it anywhere on that Penrose uh, surface that I showed you, there would be a positive area which is not illuminated. Whereas here, for a translation surface, only finitely many points may not get illuminated. Okay, so... In, in a sort of more general way, what it's really saying is, if you look at the original uh, naively post illumination problem, it means that if a room is polygonal and each angle uh, of the polygon a rational multiple of pi, then no matter where the candle is placed, only finitely many locations in the room will not be illuminated. That is, points in the room will not get illuminated. Okay, so I'm just going to hope that this video shows. Again, this, this uh, is about, it's a documentary. It's called Secrets of the Surface, a vision of Mariam Mirzakhani's mathematics. So let me just cross fingers and hope you can actually see this. Are you seeing it? Yes. Behind solving the problems. Then you try hard, hard, and you can't find a solution. And suddenly you say, oh, that's it. And I think my Musa Honey could show this passion to everyone. We had just started middle school, and we became close friends. It was always very motivating to try to compete with the boys. It was in 1994 in Hong Kong. Mayam got a gold medal. She got 40 out of 42. She became well known. More women came into mathematics after that. Being a girl and having earned a gold medal at Olympia it was very inspiring, knowing that it's not impossible. Trying to prove a theorem is like trying to climb a mountain which nobody has ever climbed. At some point, you kind of saw it like, let's see the top. But then there is a ravine in front, and we were stuck. I thought that I had a good way of doing it, but I found that actually what I was doing is being wrong. I have no idea. Do you? No, I have no idea. <laughs> she was thinking and not going anywhere. She was unhappy. They used some result which contained the table. Part of the proof just evaporated. 
sometimes she would see she was happy. Like she said, oh, I have this idea and I hope it's correct. Actually, let me not think about it. But I want to enjoy the feeling that it might be correct. Good mathematicians have the courage to imagine that they can solve a problem and to imagine an answer. Mariam Mirzakani, for her outstanding contributions to the dynamics and geometry of Riemann surfaces and their moduli spaces. In 2014, she became the first woman to win the Fields Medal, the most prestigious prize in mathematics. It's a huge breakthrough. A bunch of problems that you could not even approach, you couldn't solve at all, you couldn't even think about them. You can now solve just by applying this theorem. Mario would see influences of all these different fields. Instead of trying to understand just implications, she was trying to understand how things would interact. She would start describing sort of elaborate stories or mathematical narratives. And these narratives were almost like science fiction. She would sort of think ahead as to what the shape of the theory might be that was yet to be discovered. For the Iranian community, that was a really proud moment. Mariam is one of the few figures that really unites the whole country. There's so few women in mathematics, so we always celebrate when we hear of a fantastic new young woman. People look at her and see what she accomplished, and girls will look at that and say, that can be me. It doesn't matter being the first one. You can do anything that you want to, and you put your desire and your efforts in. Um, so these are the references for uh, the work that I've presented on Mariam. And I just now want to use a little bit of the time to talk about women in women in mathematics in India. Um, so what's the current scenario that we find? Uh, things have been improving really steadily. That's what I would say. About 30 years ago, uh, if you looked at a mathematics classroom at the undergraduate level, you would have had a very small percentage of women being uh, women being students. And if you look at a university like Delhi University, for example, now the undergrad maths classes have 50% women or more. And um, in fact, the percentage of women in master's programs and MPhil programs goes even higher. Uh, and in the last decade, what has definitely also happened is the proportion of women doing PhD in mathematics has also gone up. So the, if you look at the All India Survey of Higher Education, uh, which the government of India brings out, its 2020 data shows that 46% of the PhD students in mathematics are women. And they're the highest if you look at the science and STEM disciplines. Um, and, you know, you do have a lot of women who are in the faculty positions, particularly if you look at, say, colleges in a place like Delhi University. But this trend does not continue. Um, the way I look at it is that maybe, uh, and this is with all fingers crossed, I say this, that in maybe 10 or 15 years time, we would probably have uh, enough women who have done PhDs, who have entered into the faculty po uh, positions. And uh, since th that number will be hopefully large, then you will also find women uh, going higher up the ladder. But currently, it's not very positive when you look at the faculty positions. And typically, university maths departments have about 30% women faculty. And it becomes progressively worse if you start looking at IITs or Indian Statistical Institute or the research institutes and so on. So in those places, it's... Um, it, you could either have none or at most something like 15 to 18 percent. Okay. Um, now, why does this happen? I mean, it would uh, it would be easy to say that, you know, there are not enough women entering into it. There's too much pressure on them and so on. But that's not the same in every discipline, right? The societal pressures which are there are similar across disciplines on women. So, there's something that's happening in mathematics, which is allowing a far more leaky pipeline. Um, and we really need to see why that is the case. 
And uh, I think one of the problems is that when women are entering into mathematics or sciences, they don't already see a large number of faculty members who are like them, right? So that creates its own set of problems. And uh, we also actually need to do a lot more research on this. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at societies abroad, professional math societies abroad, they actually encourage uh, research on the situation of women in science and mathematics. And somehow we need that to happen in India as well. It's not yet happening here. Um, so I want to talk about what have we been doing in India. Um, so if you recall in 2010, we were to have the International Conference of Women in Mathematics prior to the ICM. And in, as part of the preparation, in 2009, we had a conference in Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, and it was called Advances in Mathematics, Focus on Women in Mathematics a little over 50% of the speakers were women and the audience also had more than 50% women. There was a panel discussion of women in maths and uh, you can actually uh, probably find archived material on this in the JNU website. And then in 2010, we had the ICWM and you already saw Ingrid Dubashi uh, for a bit in the... Um, she just came uh, for a few seconds in the last video that I showed on, on Mariam. And she became, she was the first woman to become the president of the International Mathematical Union. And uh, as was mentioned, the so we had this ICWM type thing in 2014 in Seoul, as well as in 2010 in India. And then in 2015, the Committee for Women in Maths was, um, uh, you know, brought into uh, uh, being by the Indian Maths, uh, International Maths Union. And since then, we have the World Meeting of Mathematics in Women. And that's 2018 we had it, and we've also had it in 2022. And IWM, uh, the Indian uh, Women in Mathematics, that's their logo. And this is our, uh, this is the website. And I've been uh, involved with IWM for a very, very long time. And it's only just this last March that I stepped out of the executive council. Um, there are, you know, these are, uh, this is a poster of one of the activities that took place recently, which is a visitor program lecture series. Uh, for the pandemic period, we had those things online. But uh, this time, Ariana Mezad from France came and visited, uh, you know, Chennai and a couple of uh, Pondicherry University and Central University in Tamil Nadu, and she gave lectures. This is from the um, uh, winter school that we have. It's the Young Women uh, in Mathematics uh, one-week training program that IWM organizes. This is for bachelor students. This is from an annual conference which took place in Shiv Nadar University a couple of years ago. So IWM, how did it start coming to being? Initially, there was a conference which was held in 2012 and then subsequently a project which was supported by the National Board of Higher Mathematics. And uh, so in the period 2013 to 15, several activities took place. Jaya Ayer from Institute of Math Science Chennai was the person looking after things mainly during that time. Then in 2016, there was a revamp and Riddhi Shah took over as chair of the IWM. And then um, the basically the events that were happening earlier, they continued in a more organized kind of manner and newer things were added. Also, the Committee for Women in Maths sub started supporting various, uh, you know, you could apply for funding from them. And that allowed activities of IWM to expand. Particularly, we could invite women from SARC countries to come and attend our conference and so on. And uh, one more thing I would like to mention that the Association for Women in Mathematics, which is the American uh, body which uh, 
had uh, of women mathematicians and others uh, they completed 50 years and they there was a volume brought out commemorating 50 years of women in mathematics and uh, uh, some of us who were part of IWM we there's a chapter which tells the story of what happened with women in mathematics in India particularly IWM which is a NBHM sponsored project and uh, that was written again with Nikita Agarwal and Ambar Habi. And those of you who are interested in knowing how IWM came to be, what were the situation before that amongst uh, for women in mathematics and so on, you can get to know through that. Now, what does IWM do? Its activities, the main uh, reason why it has, why it was created was to have network for women. It tries to reach women mathematicians in all regions and also to create local networks. The idea that when you go there, you meet people who are young, uh, who are somewhat experienced, who are senior, well-established women mathematicians. So you can connect with role models. And this allows people to you know, support and encourage research activities and so on across the country. Um, so there's annual conferences, there are regional workshops, there's a visitor program where visitors from abroad as well as from uh, India go to non-metro areas also to give lectures on mathematics. And uh, these are women who, who come. Then you have mathematics workshop for young women. There's mini courses. These mini courses take place online. So And, it, and uh, there's, of course, the May 12th initiative. Now, the point is all the activities of IWM are open to everybody, men and women. And the only idea is that through these activities, because there will be a large number of women who are going to be the main speakers, the idea is that it allows both men and women to see the kind of talent that exists in women doing mathematics. Okay? And this is like a... Uh, uh, the annual conference, the blue, the yellow is the regional conferences that we've had. You can see the visitor program has covered quite a large other thing. The winter workshop is very new. It started only in, I think, 2019, maybe, or even later, uh, 20, 1920. So there are uh, there's just four such things which have happened so far. Okay. And um, before I end, I also promised that I would talk about a few Indian women mathematicians who have contributed seminally. And uh, the first person that I want to talk about is Parimala. And we were very, very lucky that uh, in that uh, conference that we had in JNU, all those years back in 2009, mm -hmm. Parimala was one of the speakers there. And she's been, and she's, she gives wonderful talks and she's also, um, very, very down to earth. People can approach her, talk to her. And at these events, that's what happens. You know, you 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 can meet uh, very senior women mathematicians who are highly distinguished and who have established themselves so very well. And they are able to share their wisdom with you. They're able to share their mathematics with you. And that really encourages everybody. So Parimala for... Uh, a very, very long time was in the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. And she's now a arts and sciences distinguished professor of mathematics at Emory University. She's in fact a fellow of all three Academy of Sciences, but uh, the ones that are mentioned here are fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, and uh, there is the National Academy of Sciences. She's a fellow of all three of those. She's a Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar awardee, the biggest prize that award that government of India gives to people from uh, sciences. Uh, she's got the Srinivasa Ramanujan Birth Centenary Award in 2003, the uh, uh, first prize for mathematics in 2005. And in fact, she was the, I mean, in its 20 year history, Parimala was the first woman to get the Quas prize. She's also a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. In as early as 1994, in the International Congress of Mathematicians in Zurich, she was an invited speaker and she gave a talk on study of quadratic forms, some connections with geometry. 
Parimala, of course, works in algebra and her research uses tools from number theory, algebraic geometry and topology. Now, um, it, I mean, it would take another talk to talk about Parimala's work and things. These are just a few of the facts, which, of course, anybody can find on the net. But um, one place which I would uh, recommend to look at for women mathematicians and their biographies is Agnes Scott College maintains a website and that also gives some very interesting information. Um, just two more people that I want to talk about. Sujata Ramadurai, again, a fantastic speaker. It's a delight to hear her uh, give talks. And uh, she was Parimala's student, initially worked in uh, the kind of area that Parimala worked in, but uh, has since then established herself as a foremost number theorist. Together with quotes, Fukaya, Kato, and Venjakob, she formulated a non-commutative version of the main conjecture of Iwasawa theory, on which much of the foundation of that area depends. So she's someone, again, who's established herself wonderfully. She got the, uh, in 2006, she got the ICTP Ramanujan Prize, Bhatnagar Awardee in 2014, Krieger Nelson Prize in 2020, and she was on the National Knowledge Commission as well. And most recently in 2023, she got the Padma Shri from the government of India. Yeah. And she's currently a professor of mathematics and Canada research chair at University of British Columbia, Canada. And she's someone who's um, very, very interested in making, making mathematics reach to even school children and accessible to everybody. So she's, she has, uh, she works, um, she's established um, you know, uh, NGO, charitable organizations which do these things as well. And she commits a lot of her time to that. And uh, the youngest of the mathematicians that I would like to mention is Nina Gupta. She's, uh, as you can see, she was born in 1984. She's very young. She's a professor at the StatMath unit at the Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. And in 2014, she solved the Zariski cancellation problem in positive characteristic. She was awarded um, the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award in 2019. She's a fellow, made the fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences in 2021. She got the ICTP Ramanujan Prize in 2022. And in the last ICM, she was an invited speaker at the International uh, Congress of Mathematicians. Her primary fields of interest are commutative algebra and affine algebraic geometry. I mean, uh, there are, of course, a large number of other mathematicians. I've mentioned Riddhi, I've mentioned Neela, I've mentioned Vijay Lakshmi, Sauli Gun, then there's Maithili Ramaswamy, uh, people who've done really wonderful work. And you can read something about their lives. Uh, in Leelawati's Daughters, which was brought out by the Indian Academy of Sciences. It was edited by Ram Ramaswamy and Rohini uh, Godpole. So again, that's something where you can look up. Uh, those have uh, stories of women uh, in the from the science subjects and mathematics. So with this, I will say, um, oh, uh, one picture I put of Marina Vyazovska, who's the second woman to win the Fields Medal, and she was from Ukraine uh, originally. Uh, she's a professor in Zurich, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that insightful talk, and we are very grateful for enriching our minds. Uh, now we are opening up the platform for any questions from the participants. Any questions? Ma'am, just one one small question. So the result which uh, uh, Mariam proved regarding discounting the number of geodesics, simple closed geodesics. So she said it is drawing like polynomially. Mm. And before her, the other bound was exponential bound. Yeah. Of course, there, think, the, uh, there the genus is not involved. 
in yes the... so my question was regarding that only so is it so that because maria counted the involved the genus into the picture so she was able to get columnal bound or uh, uh, is it well, so that you cannot uh, obtain the genus for non simple surfaces you are asking the wrong person this question because i don't really work in this area and i haven't really read the paper so i wouldn't be able to tell you what she may uh, so so but i think the way to look at it is obviously the genus is involved because um i mean so so what was done earlier was a very general result right it's looking at hyperbolic surfaces the only uh, again i have not seen that paper but from the result it appears to be that you are fixing the length of the geodesic closed geodesic and then you're saying that if you have a hyperbolic you know if you're looking at hyperbolic surfaces and you're trying to count how many closed geodesics it can have of length at most l then we saw that it was growing like e to the power l by l now right. even if you fix the genus g right there are going to be um i mean so the point is that uh i don't think it's the genus which is restricting it yeah that's what i i was thinking okay so I, I, my feeling because of the comment that i put in there was also that she's looking at simple closed geodesics whereas the other paper is looking at general geodesics general so those geodesics. geodesics can cross themselves and the conclusion in fact from uh, bariam's result is that it, that when you even within the genus g if you're counting uh, close geodesics it's going to have an exponential kind of growth hmm. but when you come down to closed simple geodesics simple. then you're going to get polynomial growth so which is why then you conclude that most geodesics even in genus g will be self intersecting yes because of the gap but i'm saying this out of purely reasoning from what i put on this slide um other experts who work in her area may be able to say far more about this so that's very interesting i mean this is a remarkable uh, improvement from exponential decay to polynomial decay so so yeah. it's a remarkable result thank you ma'am um, any other questions yes i have one question for ma'am sure uh, ma'am uh, ma i have a general question like about women researcher why women researcher are very less um, as i read one article from maria mirza khani that she wrote that uh, the more i spent time on maths doing maths the more excited i got so is 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 this uh, like uh, issue that why women researchers are very less because they are not giving proper time uh, to do maths at one stage so what do you think ma'am and what's your motivation to do maths mm. see i mean i think when you uh, those of us whether we are men or women who do mathematics you will realize that once you fall in love with maths you can't fall out of love with maths so it, it, it you know you you uh, i don't know about uh, others but i find that uh, maths is the one constant i have had in my life well, other things keep changing and so on and so forth but for the longest period uh, ever since my undergraduate days um, when i actually started immersing myself in mathematics it's 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 the one thing which is there with you always right and uh, irrespective of uh you know maybe you are upset with somebody you know someone in your office has not spoken well to you you are caught in some bureaucratic hassle but when you get that when you make that time to do a piece of mathematics it you can just put out all the other things and the, the biggest problem i think that women tend to face is being able to carve that time out to do that piece of mathematics so sometimes there are multiple demands on your time 
um, often uh, in most societies, I would not pinpoint just India here, in most societies, there's a certain um, to be very risk averse. You want to try and find the most uh, secure job or safe job that you can find as soon as you can. That's the way women are often brought up. So the tendency is to choose a job which may be, you may be better than the kind of job that you're doing. But you will probably go and choose that job because it allows you a security and safety at a certain stage in life. So that's one of the choices that women tend to make, which uh, then probably means that they're not waiting for a better job uh, where more research opp opportunities are there. So that's one aspect that happens with women. The second is that, uh, unfortunately, in most societies, the maximum burden of looking after the family falls on the women. Right? Whether uh, it is in a household with parents or who are older or you have young children or you're married, invariably a lot of that tends to fall on the women. So uh, typically there are activities that are related to looking after family which takes away your time, which uh, uh, correspondingly men often don't have to do that. So while I think the excitement from doing mathematics, the potential to do mathematics, the, uh, the fact that there are mathematically talented people in both men and women is true. But unfortunately, there are circumstances which often prevent the girls. Many of them are cultural, many of them are societal. But there are also systemic uh, barriers which stand in the way of women. See, typically, if you look at what happens, uh, you know, in an interview for a job, right? Uh, there, you will only tend to look at how many papers have got published in how good a journal and so on and so forth. You will not see necessarily that what else that woman had to look after or do to be able to even produce that much versus what happens to the men. So these are genuine problems, but I think people are getting more and more aware of these things. And uh, so hopefully it will all change for the better. Thank the, you, the key point is to keep doing the maths. Don't give up on that. It will bring you far more pleasure and joy in your life than anything else. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, now to the to end this memorable event on a high note, I request Dr. Deepthi Sharma, Assistant Professor BMU, to give the word of thanks. Uh, Ma'am, uh, before I uh, say something, uh, I just want to really appreciate you for defining the word passion. When you said that, find out one thing which remains constant. I mean, such a wonderful way to express the term passion because it is one of the most difficult terms to define. So thank you very much for that, ma'am. And such an informative session. I feel honored and privileged to get the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on this special occasion. On behalf of the organizing committee and the entire BMU family, I would like to thank and extend my heartfelt gratitude to you, ma'am, uh, for sharing such inspiring and informative insights with us. And also on behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to convey our deep regards to our vice chancellor, Professor Shyam Menon for his constant support and guidance and many appreciation to the entire organizing committee to make this event possible. And of course, all those who attended the session to make it more memorable. And once again, ma'am, thank you so much for providing such a wonderful definition of the word passion. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, the session has come to an end. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.